1822, a statue of the Greek hero Achilles was planned for Hyde Park. But when it got out that he was to be naked, there was outrage. Fifty years before, a little bit of nudity would never have caused such a rumpus in Britain. But now society had become acutely sensitive to any suggestion of public immorality. One man had led the extraordinary national sea change. The MP and social reformer, William Wilberforce. We tend to think of Wilberforce as the great hero of the abolition of slavery, not as some sort of killjoy or a bit of a prude. The truth is that his views were entirely consistent. He thought the same human failures that caused the wickedness of slavery abroad also caused what he saw as slavery to wickedness at home. Wilberforce was the driving force behind what you could call, without exaggeration, a moral revolution. And its impact here was as great as the French or even the Industrial Revolution. Though unlike those two, it's been largely forgotten. He became the conscience of the nation and inspired a generation of eccentric, obsessive, yet remarkable men and women. Together, these individuals, some well-known, others obscure, wrestled in their different ways with the big question, what can I do? And the answer utterly transformed Britain. Now everyone has the right to an education, a home and protection at work, or in hospital, or in any dealings with public servants. We expect to be free from incompetence, unfairness and corruption. And that is thanks to these people who tackled society's ills head on. These are the ones who looked around them and didn't just say, this is terrible, this is sad, but this is wrong and we must try and change it. They're easy to mock and I certainly won't be resisting the temptation. But also, I take my hat off to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the do-gooders. Turn the tide, please. Uh, turn, her. turn her on. No, three to one. Yes, sir. Thank you. In the last decades of the 18th century, Britain was a country where losers hugely outnumbered winners. Many of the moneyed classes lived for pleasure, insulated by privilege and patronage as they'd been for centuries. The poor largely lived in misery, exploited and neglected by their social superiors. They grabbed the obvious comforts where they could. In a nominally Christian country, the strong exploited the weak and vice trumped virtue. Yep, he's gonna do it! Excellent, a winner to end. Brilliant. Few thought this could, or should, be any different. And certainly not the 24-year-old William Wilberforce. In 1784, as a new MP for the county of Yorkshire, he attended York's fashionable races, just one of the many loud and colourful events he indulged in. When he wasn't in the House of Commons, he enjoyed London's hedonistic attractions to the full. He danced at balls till four o'clock in the morning. He kept parties amused with his wicked impersonations of his fellow politicians. As he accepted the cheers of the crowd, his future as one of the country's fast-living smart set must have seemed assured.
But just a year on, Wilberforce had become a changed man. Haunted by a premonition of British society collapsing. In August 1785, Wilberforce had a terrifying vision. He wrote, I fancy I can see storms arising, which already, no bigger than a man's hand, will overspread and blacken the whole face of heaven. It is the universal corruption and profligacy of the times, which, taking its rise among the rich and luxurious, has extended its baleful influence and spread its destructive poison through the whole body of the people. Wilberforce's crisis had been provoked by a religious conversion to evangelical Christianity. While most of his peers believed the existing order was natural, he now saw that change was both possible and vital, and that he was the one to make it happen. Wilberforce had decided that in order to be good, he had to do good. I'm going to Lambeth Palace to see someone who's no stranger himself to the problems of providing moral leadership. I was asked some years ago who I thought was the greatest Britain of the last millennium, and I said without hesitation, William Wilberforce. The abolition of slavery was not a foregone conclusion, and he actually made a measurable difference to the human dignity of millions. Like a lot of these do-gooders, he had extraordinary energy in hundreds of other fields, that's right, didn't he? That's right. He, he gives his energy to questions around uh, the reformation of manners. Um, we wince at that. We think, oh, this is self-righteous and priggish. But you look at England and you think that really was a question about <laughs> public civility and ordinary decency to be addressed. There really was a challenge. Wilberforce and the people who derive their thinking and their perspective from him would all have said, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We are actually answerable for the condition of our neighbour. And as the 19th century unfolds, you more and more have the notion, well, actually, society is something we can, we can change the shape of. Back in the 1780s, Wilberforce, though fired up with the spirit of reform, was still just starting out, and he knew he needed help. So he went to the top and persuaded the king to urge all Britons to improve their behaviour with a royal proclamation. but observe with inexpressible concern the rapid progress of impiety and licentiousness and that deluge of profaneness, immorality and every kind of vice, which to the scandal of our holy religion and to the evil example of our loving subjects hath broken in upon this nation. Despite its royal trappings, the proclamation seemed to fall on deaf ears. But then fear forced the rich to see that Wilberforce might be onto something, and especially that you neglected the poor at your peril. In 1789, revolution erupted in France. Tales of violence, bloodshed, and mob rule flooded Britain. Now a homegrown rabble baying for blue blood seemed a terrifying possibility. As a result, supporters flocked to Wilberforce's bandwagon, offering not violent revolution, but moral evolution. Wilberforce himself was convinced that small changes would add up to a national turnaround and backed a host of societies, demanding zero tolerance on swearing, drinking and debauchery. He also spoke out against duelling and helped set up the RSPCA, as well, of course, as his 40-year fight to secure the abolition of slavery. 
all in all, he inspired an upsurge of campaigners to change the nation one step at a time. Wilberforce could be called the godfather of the do-gooders. After him, do-gooding became more and more popular and society became increasingly serious-minded, sober, straight-laced. Of course, worrying about the genitals on a statue is pretty silly, but out of this obsession for decency and right conduct came the quest, not just for self, but for social improvement. And that was the crucial idea of those who were following in Wilberforce's earnest footsteps, that manners, good behaviour, really do maketh man. In 1813, an essay was published in a series called A New View of Society. It was dedicated to Wilberforce as the nation's leading reformer, and it offered up a radical vision. A new view of society proposed that the key to creating human happiness was to change human character. The author of this enlightened view was Robert Owen, who went on to argue that the character of the masses, their miseries and their vices, arose not from some innate sinfulness, but from their pitiful circumstances. Improve their environment, give them education, and utopia could be created. Incredibly, Owen had already started to build his own New Jerusalem amongst the dark satanic mills. And he chose to create his ideal community, not in England's green and pleasant land, but in Scotland's harsher climate, here in the mill town of New Lanark. <laughs> Owen was writing in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, which was then transforming Britain. But his perspective was a world away from other factory owners. The wealth that early 19th century people were making was being made out of the sweat of other fellow human beings. If you made a lot of money uh, out of a mill in the north, or out of a small factory in the middle of Birmingham. The reason you'd made your money was that lots of other people had worked on your behalf. They'd worked like slaves. Compared with these industrialists, Robert Owen, appropriately, was cut from a different cloth. The son of a Welsh postmaster, he'd risen to become manager of a successful Manchester mill. Yet he was never one for conformity. He was practically an atheist when almost everyone else was a Christian. It was not, however, until he took over at New Lanark in 1800 that Owen had the chance to put the full extent of his original thinking into practice. What makes Owen so interesting and so special, I think, is that he sees work, money, economics as all part of a, a much bigger political system. The whole of society could be reordered. Yes, this extraordinary thing has happened, the Industrial Revolution, but it doesn't mean that as a matter of inevitability the market will determine everything. Human beings are still in charge of their own destiny and they can, if they wish, shape the economic situation in which they find themselves and they can make it more just or less just. He wanted, obviously, to make it more just. Owen's first step was the improvement of the workers' homes, which were often filthy and infested with lice. But he soon encountered a snag. A residence committee was appointed to check up on every home every week. The men didn't seem to mind, but the women did. They called the inspectors the bug hunters, and they sent them packing. Owen had come across the stumbling block familiar to many do-gooders. What happens when people don't want to be done good to? After all, all Britons of all classes have traditionally valued their liberty. 
and the women of New Lanark didn't care that Owen had their best interests at heart. They felt that what went on behind their front doors, in their homes, was their own business. <laughs> Owen, however, was no pushover. He threatened the women with eviction, and they soon cleaned up. But at the mills, he preferred the carrot to the stick. And there he devised an ingenious way to encourage performance. Here it is, the cutting-edge early 19th century management tool the silent monitor. Every worker at New Lanark had one of these hung on a pillar next to their workstation, and the colour facing outward indicated performance. So it was white for excellent, yellow for good, blue for indifferent, and black for bad. Now, if that all sounds a bit children's star chart to us, Remember, a lot of these workers were no more than children when they started, and Owen's methods of discipline and trying to increase efficiency compared to other mill owners of the time, where you might just get a whack, are positively humane. So there it is, the original 360-degree assessment. Owen also realised that the foundation stone of his new society had to be its children. This was the first school in Britain to offer lessons to children as young as four. But in these infant classes, the key subjects were not reading, writing and arithmetic, but getting on with each other, sharing, being kind. No child was, as Owen put it, to be annoyed with books until he or she was seven. There was no corporal punishment, lots of music and dancing which Owen believed would distract the children from forming vicious habits. It was all years ahead of its time. In many ways, years ahead of ours. In his own time, 20,000 tourists flocked to New Lanark to see for themselves what Owen had achieved. Most left impressed. Not so the romantic poet Robert Southey. Southey found Owen vain and thought he was deluding himself. He actually compared New Lanark to a slave plantation. He writes, his system, instead of aiming at perfect freedom, can only be kept in play by absolute power. The formation of character why, the end of his institutions would be, as far as possible, the destruction of all character. Those were, and remain, the criticisms of New Lanark. It was paternalistic, it was autocratic, it stifled freedom. Yet, it's worth remembering that this was not some tin-pot fringe outfit. This was the biggest spinning operation in the British Isles, and a hugely profitable one, run along completely different moral lines than the rest of the Industrial Revolution, and headed by a figure who was overtly critical of its laissez-faire attitude. That's surely some achievement. Owen hoped his new Lanark model could be replicated nationwide. But despite his success, the government dismissed him as a crazed eccentric, a rejection which Owen never got over. Owen's vision had been too radical, too utopian for the powers that be. But in the cosy world of Pall Mall and St James, the spirit of reform that had been unleashed across Britain was successfully unsettling the nation's establishment. Authority had always resided in the hands of a very few, but the country's decision makers and power brokers were finding their self-serving natural order was now under attack. Although full democracy, votes for all, was still more than a century and many struggles away, 
gradually more and more people were coming to question how fair, how moral, how healthy was this model of society. And oddly, it was in the field of health that one of the first and most furious assaults on the status quo came. It was medicine, and in particular, surgery, that was under attack. In the first half of the 19th century, the operating table was still a very dangerous place to be. The surgical profession was dominated by a sort of priestly caste who'd reached their preeminence not so much by what they knew as by who they knew. Of all the professions, reforming surgery was literally a matter of life and death. The doctor who changed the status quo was Thomas Wackley. He fought injustice all his life, but in his youth it was medical frauds and the conduct and cronyism of his own superiors which roused his fury. The great problems with medicine in the early 19th century were that the power of medicine which was the knowledge of medicine, was held in the hands of a few incredibly rich doctors working at London teaching hospitals. To go to a lecture for that surgeon, you would have to, as a student, pay money to the surgeon. And Wackley saw that as a huge mischief. He wanted to democratise medicine. He wanted to take the knowledge out of their hands and make it available to everybody. And, of course, he came up against incredible opposition. Wackley resolved to mount an attack on the surgical establishment in print, in his own anonymous journal. He called it The Lancet. This is a lancet, a surgical tool for cutting into flesh and removing foreign bodies or rotting tissue. But, I hope you're listening at the back, this is also a lancet. An arched window with a point at the top. And both senses served Wackley's intentions. The Lancet was to be a window of truth, shedding light on best medical practice, and also a knife to root out the stench of corruption. Here is the very first editorial on October the 5th, 1823, which was so powerful. I mean, still today, it sends a tingle down my spine. We hope the age of mental delusion has passed and that mystery and concealment will no longer be encouraged. Indeed, we trust that mystery and ignorance will shortly be considered synonymous. I mean, this was what it was about. It was about a revolution. It was anonymous, though, wasn't it? He was 27 <laughs> when he founded this. Right. So he was a nobody. I mean, and he was going up against the great powers of medicine at the time. So, yeah, he was hiding as much <laughs> as he could behind his words. But what a writer. Yeah. I mean, this was like dropping a bomb in the middle of medicine in London in 1823. The Lancet drew blood from the medical establishment in many skirmishes. But in 1828, it went for the jugular and revealed the high price of nepotism in an expose of a bungled operation to remove a bladder stone. The surgeon made a small incision in the perineum. That's the area between the anus and the scrotum. And then he went in with the forceps to get the stone, which he failed to do. Then he tried to make the hole bigger. Having botched around a bit, tried again to get the stone and failed. By this time, he was starting to panic, so he asked one of his colleagues whether he had a long finger, i.e. so he could go in um, and get more purchase. Amazingly, all the while, the patient, an otherwise healthy labourer, was strapped to the operating table, fully awake. The Lancet describes the scene. Every now and again, there were cries of hush, followed by the stillness of death broken only by the awful squash, squash of the forceps in the perineum. And this poor bloke was obviously having second thoughts by then, as he started crying out, saying, God, let it go! Pray, let it keep in! Eventually, they got the stone out, but the whole procedure, which was meant to take minutes, took an hour. So, a successful operation? Yes, except for the fact that 29 hours later, 
he was dead. The clumsy surgeon was Bransby Cooper, the nephew of the former president of the Royal College of Surgeons, Sir Astley Cooper. Bransby now cried libel and sued Wackley. The court case was the hottest ticket in town. The Times reports covers pages and pages of it. As for the case itself, well, Wackley produced all his witnesses who'd been there at the operation, and the surgeon, Bransby Cooper, produced his witnesses, uh, most of whom hadn't been there. The judge's summing up uh, was particularly biased. Uh, he had sitting next to him on the bench a number of senior surgeons, including Sir Astley Cooper. So that's the uncle of the plaintiff is sitting next to the judge. Well, Wackley did his best and he gave a rousing defence uh, of his own conduct. The hospital belongs not to the directors, but to the poor, for whose use public funds had been granted. So that was someone attacking his own class, his own profession, in order to set standards that would be for the good of the general public. Unsurprisingly, the jury found in the surgeon's favour. But it only ordered Wackley to pay token damages. And more importantly, the Lancet's reputation was established. Even today, just over 180 years later, Wackley's first principles still dictate the journal's agenda. Always, the standards of medicine have to be looked at and scrutinised. What Thomas Wackley was about was trying to improve the standards of medicine. That was his commitment. We don't do it anywhere near as well as he did it, but that's always what we're aspiring to do. We usually think of the 19th century as an era of progress and discovery, when great leaps were made in science and technology. But knowledge and the power it brings is of no use if it's in the hands of people you don't trust. As the century went on, what Wackley was appealing for in surgery, accountability, responsibility, standards, was demanded by others in their own professions and institutions. In fact, throughout the country, high-minded men and women were proving themselves as much the engineers of modern Britain as Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who built this station, or George Stevenson, the great railway pioneer. To these people, modernity needed morality. Yes, the do-gooders were busy social engineering in an age that wasn't embarrassed by that phrase. They were trying to make a new society work. In the 1840s, Birmingham was crying out for just this sort of intervention. In 40 years, its population had almost tripled and now neared 200,000 people. Many lived in slums. Sanitation was poor. The local council was out of its depth. And no one else was stepping up to the responsibility. Into this chaos arrived George Dawson, a non-conformist preacher and a bit of a showman. He loved to wear velvet frock coats and gaudy cravats. But this was nothing compared to the dramatic impact of his message. He told his congregation it was their duty to take responsibility for their own town. This is Birmingham's Museums and Art Galleries Collection Centre, and it's to here that it's consigned one of its greatest heroes. Ah, and is that him? Yeah, that's George Dawson. Good grief. Next to a coffin. <laughs> By a mill shaft. I suppose he would have liked the symbolism of that. I think so. Death and industry. <laughs> Thank you.
now neglected. In his own time, Dawson was so popular, he even had his own church built. To discover what made it so special, I met up with one of the few people who does remember what its minister achieved. The church of George Dawson was just across the road there. Sadly, it is no longer there. There's nothing? No, not even a plaque. George Dawson was a man who preached a powerful, compelling, yet challenging message. He challenged the rich, not just to come to church on a Sunday, and put a few bob publicly and ostentatiously into the plates as they left, but to do more. He said that a great town or city is a solemn organism through which should flow and in which should be shaped all the truest, loftiest and highest ideals of the moral and intellectual nature of man. Look at those words. Don't they stir you? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. People used to queue here to listen to him. I mean, can you imagine? He had a, a mass of black hair cascading down to his shoulders, and then yeah. he pierced you with his eyes that darted hither and thither and said, don't say, what can I do? Ask, what more can I do? It doesn't fit in with laissez-faire, does it, or individualism? Not hugely, no. And that's why I think he's been overlooked today, because we're living in a society where major political parties of whatever political complexion for the last 40 years have been saying, look after yourself, look after number one. Dawson's saying, no, no, let's look after each other. Love thy neighbour as thou wouldst love thyself. I was going to ask where his legacy's gone, but I, I seem to be standing opposite <laughs> it. <laughs> George Dawson's radical message came to be called the civic gospel. I wondered if any of it was still echoing around the streets of today's Birmingham. He felt that you should um, be proud of your city and do something for it. Yeah. Do you think there's anything of that left here? Not <laughs> really, but there should be, cos I love Birmingham, I love Birmingham. His basic message is everyone who lives in a city like Birmingham should do something for the city. Do you think anyone feels that anymore? No. Do you think people are more out for themselves now? I think so, yes. I don't want to get too uh, philosophical. No, no, go, get philosophical. You know, we live in that, what they say is a capitalist society and that um, uh, promotes individual liberty, so, I mean, that is the uh, society that we live in. So. As a whole, I think people are very much independent, kind of, very much look after your own. Customers. Is it a place you're going to stay? OK, personally, are you going to live here? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dawson, like Robert Owen at New Lanark, wanted the working classes to experience more than the hard grind of industrial life. But, like Wilberforce, his ambitions were not only inspired by dreams of improvement, they were also fuelled by fear. In 1848, another wave of revolts spread like wildfire across continental Europe, many tipping into outright revolution. Discontent was in the air, and Dawson wanted to defuse it. In 1848, he wrote a letter to the middle classes in the present crisis, urging them to get involved, not to watch from the sidelines, and arguing that bloody turmoil abroad had been provoked and could be tipped over at home by resistance to change. On you, he wrote, it depends whether we advance peacefully but quickly in the path of progress or whether we must succumb, on the one hand, to injustice and on the other, to anarchy. Remember, reform delayed is revolution begun. Many were inspired to act by Dawson's fervent, if florid, prose. Thanks to him, Birmingham was civilised by an array of impressive services provided by the people, for the people public parks and gardens, education for local workers, hospital wards for the poor, and a free reference library. Dawson inspired them all. Even so, he was not without his critics, and he didn't get so much done without coming in for a bit of ribbing.
This is the town crier, 19th century Birmingham's very own satirical magazine. And it's uh, the usual mix of feeble topical jokes. What motive took a great many people to London on the 7th of March? A locomotive. A train, you see. Topical reference. By this time, Dawson was known as a great orator, but his style didn't actually impress the town crier. He's going to give a lecture, Dawson, on Louis Napoleon. People must come in time to my lectures. They must not cough. I will not be interfered with. If I am annoyed any further, I will lecture on the subject of the audience instead of Louis Napoleon. So he was clearly quite vain. But the fact that the town crier bothers to do all this in some way suggests that Dawson had been successful, that what happens in Birmingham mattered to people. The town crier actually runs a series of editorials. Listen to this addressed to everybody earning over £600 a year. Every one of you owes something to Birmingham. Most of you owe all you have to it. And yet many of you have never given an hour's thought or help for the improvement of that place which has made you what you are. Why is this? It seems Dawson's message, however long-winded or boring or vain, had hit home. George Dawson died in 1876, aged only 55. The civic gospel, however, lived on and spread far beyond Birmingham. When today we praise the notion of public service, it is men like George Dawson we have to thank. We're so attuned to it today, it so defines who we are as a nation and what we want out of our government and institutions, that we tend to think that a public service ethos has always been with us. In fact, it was a Victorian invention, and perhaps the greatest one of all. Until then, the tacit assumption had been that the whole point of gaining power or office was to take advantage of it, to line one's pocket with backhanders and to distribute largesse amongst one's friends and family. However, here in the heart of Whitehall, there was an internal revolution, thanks to one civil servant who looked at what was going on around him and decided that the rot had to stop. What Thomas Wackley did for medicine, Charles Trevelyan did for the civil service the main instrument of national administration. For Trevelyan, life was no laughing matter. It was for seriousness and self-scrutiny. Even when courting his wife-to-be, it was said he talked of steam navigation, the education of natives, the equalisation of the sugar duties, and the substitution of the Roman for the Arabic alphabet. Twenty years later, he was still applying the same rigorous standards in his job as the top permanent official at the Treasury. And he was acutely aware of the civil service's biggest weakness. You just couldn't get the staff. He wrote privately, there can be no doubt that the high aristocracy have been accustomed to employ the civil establishments as a means of providing for the waifs and strays of their families as a sort of foundling hospital where they might receive a nominal office but real pension for life at the expense of the public. When he was asked by the Chancellor, William Gladstone, to head up a report into civil service recruitment, he leapt at the opportunity and he didn't pull any punches. In the interests of efficiency, he urged reform. And was he demanding mass resignations, wholesale sackings, the closure of departments? No. Something much worse. He was proposing an entrance examination. Discuss the relative influence of literary men on politics in England Make and France philological notes during on the, the following century. Give an account Ford. of the principal Uncle legislative enactments well during the last 50 years. Has morality a price in social economy? The repercussions were enormous. 
An examination would mean an end to the old recruitment system of, basically, jobs for the boys. And this way, the civil service would not only be run by the best people, but it would also be politically independent and give government genuinely impartial advice. Trevelyan knew exactly how much of a heart attack his proposals would give members of the great and good as they sat down to breakfast in their clubs. So he made sure that he had their newspaper, The Times, on board and fully briefed. The leader makes its position clear. When this bill comes through, it says, it will be the fault of the people if the public service does not become their birthright according to the talent, education and industry of each. Of course, this isn't a meritocracy as we would understand it, and the Times editorial is still paternalistic and a touch patronising. The appointments of great importance will demand the attainments and be worthy of the pursuit of the most educated Englishman. And then this will go down the scale to small posts, which might recompense the industry of the head boy in the village school. Such appointments will be filled by an examination just such as the readiest and best-conducted lads in these schools would succeed in. No lasses, obviously, and it's still very hierarchical. But it is the beginning of a system in which it doesn't matter who you're related to or for whom you've done a political favour, what matters is how well you can do the job which is in the public interest. To find out how Trevelyan's legacy lives on, I met with the current head of the civil service, himself the product of a South London state school. When you join the civil service, you get given the civil service code. Right. It contains uh, the honesty, objectivity, integrity, impartiality, the values, it contains the rules about meritocracy and competition, the way people should behave, our public service ethos, and it's there in the bones of every civil servant from so, the start. So as soon as you join, Trevelyan is looking over your shoulder, really? He's there. He is, not that people know, I'm sure, but he's there in that code. The reason for that code is Trevelyan's report. Trevelyan points out absolutely clearly that um, he doesn't want people appointed on the grounds of political favours. Yes. So it, it's total impartiality. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's, that's still important for the civil service because there's been some criticism, hasn't absolutely there? Absolutely crucial. People that join the civil service have to be ready to work for and advise whoever the British public elect. I mean, if you, if you looked at the American model, for example, mm. the whole of the top of their civil service goes when yep. there's a change. I mean, Trevelyan says in his report, the public will expect this. Um, do you think that's absolutely true now? That's what um, Britain demands? I, I think the public totally expect this, and I think they're absolutely right to expect this. It's why we come down so heavily on anyone that violates those rules of impartiality, honesty. You know, we've got to do that. I think in part it's there in, in reflection to uh, problems about expenses. You know, people mm. do expect the highest standards in public life, and they're right to, and we must live up to those. We undoubtedly owe much to the pioneering reforms of Trevelyan. But the moral rigour that inspired him to improve the civil service elsewhere led him to assume a position of shocking callousness. In the mid-1840s, he was in charge of the government's woefully inadequate relief programme for victims of the Irish potato famine. This tragedy remains the worst episode in the troubled history of Anglo-Irish relations. The problem about Charles Trevelyan is that he did some do-badding in Ireland, really, didn't he? It must always be remembered against him, I'm afraid, that contemplating the Irish situation, he, he was a deplorable person. He believed that the Irish famine, in which a million people died and four million Irish had to go and live abroad, go to America or come and live here like uh, semi-slaves, uh, was their fault. Uh, he said so, he wrote so, he believed that it was because the Irish were feckless and because they were Roman Catholics that uh, the fates or God had punished them. 
Trevelyan's attitude might now appall us, but then it was in line with the moral position many Victorian believers took. Providentialism, the understanding that God was active in the world and causing certain things to happen or not happen was far more common than we might think. I tend to think that sort of mindset is uh, is part of a medieval worldview almost, but a remarkable number of 19th century men of affairs and so on who sincerely believed that that was the way things worked and could see something like the Irish famine as, as a warning or as a judgment. But amongst the English establishment, the scale of the catastrophe made many question whether this could really be accepted as the will of a loving Christian God. Instead, more and more people were opening up to the radical view that the poor were the responsibility of every citizen. Philanthropy and reform were on the march. The Irish had been left to starve. Londoners would be more fortunate. Thanks in particular to one best-selling work, the plight of the capital's most desperate residents had by the 1850s become public knowledge. Written by journalist Henry Mayhew, London Labour and the London Poor lifted the lid on life at the bottom of the social scale. A man told me he had slept in rooms so crammed with sleepers, he believed there were 30 where 12 would have been a proper number, that their breaths in the dead of night and in the unventilated chamber rose in one foul, choking steam of stench. Mayhew's book was full of stories like this one, all equally shocking. It had a powerful impact on many of its readers, including the author, Charles Dickens, but perhaps none more so than a 14-year-old girl. Octavia Hill came from a family of enlightened Christian do-gooders. From the cradle, she'd been taught to think not of her own wants, but those of others. It had even been a tradition, on one's own birthday, to give the rest of the family gifts. As an adult, Hill decided to devote herself to improving the homes of London's most deprived. This was easier said than done. When she set out to help the poor, Hill did not have the status of a statesman, industrialist or preacher. As a woman, she had to start from scratch. Hill's early attempts to rent a property to run as a lodging house went badly. It was a classic case of nimbyism. Whenever she disclosed to a letting agent what her plans actually involved, she was immediately turned down. She got so exasperated, she said to one, but where are the poor to live? And he replied, I don't know, but they must keep off the St John's Wood estate. Help came from an unlikely source, the art critic John Ruskin. A friend of Hill's and a fellow Christian socialist, he now offered her the capital to buy a freehold outright. Today, Marylebone is one of the most expensive areas in London. A studio flat can set you back a third of a million pounds. But in 1864, it was here that Hill found a property to suit her needs, in the incongruously named Paradise Place. The locals, with typical black humour, called this place Little Hell. This is the 1861 census, and it records that in this building, number three, there were living 47 people. And one of those families was the Froys. Uh, Patrick Froy, the head of the family, a shoemaker, and Froy, his wife, a general dealer, and their eight children. So that's ten of them 
living there in a very small space with 37 other people. Extraordinary. Hill had grand plans to improve this block, and rather than the standard one room per family, she wanted to offer two. But her efforts were not always met with enthusiasm. At first, Hill, like Robert Owen in New Lanark, found that old habits die very hard. She'd noted when she'd taken over that the female tenants were deadened to any sense of order or cleanliness or self-respect. And she was determined to shift that mindset. So she devised a unique method of collecting rent. Instead of sending round a man with a threat, she went herself or sent one of her female staff to collect the rent in person. This way they could develop a relationship with the family, finding out if there are any strains or problems, and then they could offer advice, support or practical solutions. They were, in effect, the first social workers. Hill went from strength to strength. By the early 1880s, 378 families were living in homes run by her, managed by an army of female helpers on Hill's own terms. In Southwark, in South London, she finally had the chance to design her ideal homes. Today, Gable Cottages are run by Octavia Housing, the descendant of Hill's own organisation. They remain an oasis in the city. Hello. James Powell has lived here for 42 years. We were fortunate that when we first moved into Octavia Hill, the landlords in those days were ladies, mm. and they were very strict but fair and they have very high standards of how a property should be looked after, how the tenants should behave. And did they tell you off? They did. <laughs> if you needed telling off, and they commented on the cleanliness, especially. What, of, of the inside of your house? Yeah, yeah. Tell me what you think was the strength of the old system. There was regular visits by people who cared yeah. deeply about the property and also the ethos of the woman who started it. Right, you think they that was really They were disciples. Apparent. They were disciples of Octavia Hill and she had very high standards. Do you think her ideas would still work today? No, because the landlord can't knock on the door and say, I want to come in and have a look. Ha! Oh, you're infringing our human rights and all this codswallop. Right, you, you'd be perfectly happy uh, for them to come yeah, in and yeah, say, yeah. that's a bit dirty. Exactly. Exactly. They've provided you with decent living. Surely you're, it's indemnit upon you to keep it up as decent. It wasn't just over cleanliness that Octavia Hill was a stickler. She also insisted her tenants should earn any extra aid they received. Hill was firmly opposed to giving cash handouts to the poor. Offer too much, she thought, and you take away any incentive to help oneself. She believed that the working classes should be encouraged to work. So rather than dole out money, she tried to rouse habits of industry and effort and find the poor jobs. In this, she wasn't alone. This was the standard Victorian position. Their greatest fear was what we now call creating a dependency culture. Today, we're still looking for a satisfactory solution to this dilemma. And as we try and tackle it now, it seems we've lost the confidence that do-gooders like Hill possessed. Octavia Hill found that in doing charity, you end up 
time after time in a position where you have to be quite tough. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because Octavia Hill was not in the business of doing this because she wanted to be liked. The, the temptation is sentimentality. Is to say, we have to go with the flow of what people say they need and, as it were, abdicate our own responsibilities of assessing what the needs really are. The Octavia Hills of this world are important because the, the sheer awkwardness that they bring to it mm. means the last thing you can say is that they're not stupid, they're not sentimental, and they're not in this to make themselves feel better. The problem for us seems to be that we look at these do-gooders and we think, that's extraordinary energy and you manage to make things happen. Mm. Is that possible, is that possible? now? Mm. I think what, what often makes people feel less hopeful now is the sense that where things are bad, they're in a, a downward spin. And then you put that in the context of a staggering economy nationally and all the global threats. And it's very easy to think it's too big. One of the things that a lot of the 19th century do-gooders would have said, I think, to that is, well, what can you do? Don't just sit there saying it's all too difficult. Just say, I can do this bit. Mm. I can do this bit and do it well. Small things are worth doing. This is the Victoria Memorial, unveiled in 1911, a vast tribute to the Queen who gave her name to an era. But it also celebrates something else. Beside the former monarch are three angels, personifications of justice, truth and charity the guiding principles of the do-gooders. Since William Wilberforce had issued his call to arms over a century before, do-gooders had transformed the nation. These po-faced allegories of moral purpose had come to represent something real. Reformers like Thomas Wackley and Charles Trevelyan had turned Britain from a country where nepotism and corruption thrived to one with a genuine reputation for impartiality and good governance. Meanwhile, philanthropists like Robert Owen, George Dawson and Octavia Hill had directed their energy and passion towards the poorest men and women in the nation, the victims of the industrial age. All of them believed that an individual could and should change society, and they did. Today, many see do-gooders as little more than interfering busybodies, and very few believe they can personally make a difference. But the achievements of these extraordinary characters and others like them should perhaps make us think that their 19th century commitment and dynamism might just have something to teach us in the 21st century. This is only the start of the do-gooders story. Next week, I look at those who tried to help society's most vulnerable and exploited members. It's children, and found it was anything but child's play. You can join Ian Hislop again as he goes off the rails. His take on the infamous beaching report of 1963 is available to watch now on BBC iPlayer. Coming up here on BBC Four, though, plagued by illness but blessed with incredible foresight and imagination, we discover how Lord Byron's daughter became a computing pioneer, calculating Ada in just a moment.